Well, you're stuck with me. So joke's on you. You could have stayed home in your comfortable beds tonight. <laughs> it's your fault now. <laughs> yeah, it's not too late. I got a good book at the house. Hot tea. Um, so before I get going, uh, Chuck runs a, it, it's a, I don't want to call it a, a, a business. He runs a, an online site. Uh, it's called Sheep Among Wolves. Um, he does a lot of videos on YouTube and he does a lot of uh, stuff that um, to help people kind of build their faith and whatnot. He's doing a fundraiser for an organization called Preborn. Um, that is an organization that helps women who are newly pregnant and uh, tries to help them to uh, decide to save the save the baby rather than um, abortion or other other means. Um, if you are interested, he is um, for every um, what's it called um, the ultrasound. That's what's called for every ultrasound that you fund through preborn. Um, he you can he he donates a hat so um, to you. So I got this by I donated to preborn. He gave me the hat. I, I didn't. I didn't say that the best way that there was to say it. Um, I, I, I'm a better writer than speaker. <laughs> Just uh, okay. So um, we're going to look at four things that we, as individuals and as a church, need from the Book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts is kind of one of those books that a lot of times we just kind of like, oh, well, that's interesting. I don't really know what it has to do with really anything in my life, but okay. <laughs> I read that and that was fun. So let me just kind of set the stage. In the Gospel of Luke, um, Luke, <laughs> who was a doctor, uh, is writing about Jesus and, you know, all these different things that he's doing. And uh, then, it, you know, it ends with Jesus dying. And uh, so that, that kind of, we go into this kind of dark period for the disciples um, everything that they hoped in kind of seems to be gone. Uh, kind of a bleak time to be one of Jesus' disciples. And, uh, you know, you got to figure it must have been even harder for some of them because some of them were actually John the Baptist's disciples before they were Jesus' disciples. So they had to deal with both of their the people that they were following dying. And uh, surely that must have felt like, well, one massive failure. And uh, so uh, Jesus rises from the dead. Wow, I didn't see that one coming. Uh, which they should have because he told them quite a few times. But <laughs> I guess it's uh, hindsight is, is twenty twenty, And um, so he raises from the dead and he gives them a few instructions and then he ascends into heaven and he says, hey, I'm going to come back. So, you know, calm down. I'm, I'm not going to be gone forever. And uh, so that's kind of what where Acts picks up. G Luke is, is more of um, the acts of Jesus. And then Acts is more of the acts of Jesus's disciples and how the church was formed. So, okay, let's take a look. We'll start with Acts chapter 1. We'll go through verses 4 through 8. And then we'll read uh, chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you guys are paying attention, paying attention to that. <laughs> We're not going to read that much. Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. So this is this is Jesus raised from the dead. He's shown himself to his disciples, and this is this is what he says before he takes off. Okay, he says, uh, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, "You heard of from me. I, I told you about this before." Verse five: For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And, but he said to them, it is not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. So um, we, we, we're gonna. There's a lot going on here, and I'm gonna try and, and try and not get ahead of myself here. Um, but there's gonna be four things I'm looking at, and in, 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 that we're gonna look at in Acts about things that we not only need as a church, but things that we as individuals need to move forward. Do you ever feel like sometimes in your life you just kind of get stuck in, in your spiritual walk? Maybe it turns into more of a club than anything. You're not really feeling like you're getting anything out of the church experience or the whole Bible thing or anything like that. I mean, just in Yams last night, we were talking about the way that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of us, um, Yams is the young adult group. 
a lot of us in the young adult group, myself included, said, hey, we, we think that the Bible is, you know, God's word that is important. But then we turned around and said, so what do we do with that belief? Do we actually read it throughout the week? And most of us said, well, well, no. So it was like head knowledge. Yes, the Bible is good. But then in living it out, we actually didn't incorporate it into the week. And Isaiah is sitting over there like, yeah, I heard this last night. <laughs> um, but OK, so. Four things, and these are things that, like I said, these are things that will help you to not feel like you are personally in a rut where it's not going to be like the church is like a club, but it's something where we can move forward. Because churches do go through slumps where they just don't really, they just kind of gets to be like a, a thing that I go to every week and moving on. Like now I can get on with the rest of my week. And that's definitely something that happens to all of us. So in, in order for the church to move forward, sorry, it shouldn't. But it oftentimes is. In order for the church to move forward, the first thing they needed was Jesus' instruction. So before the church ever got going, they, the, the very first thing that they needed was Jesus' instruction. If you read through Luke and you see how much Jesus, of his time Jesus spent just instructing them, knowing that he wasn't going to be there forever. You know, sometimes we as parents, right, we'll, we'll, we'll take time and teach our kids something, but we won't really... We'll, we'll do it as though we're always going to be there instead of doing it from a place of I'm preparing you for when I'm not going to be there, which is, isn't something we like to think about. But I mean, it's it's probably with, we're probably not going to live as long. We're, our kids will probably outlive us. Usually. I mean, obviously, hopefully, hopefully um, uh, as someone who has lost a child, it's one of those things that you definitely hope that you go before your child. <laughs> so anyways, um, uh, so the very first thing we see Jesus doing but before he ever, you know, before he ever dies, I mean, think about it. He didn't come just to die. He came, he instructed his disciples, gave them the time, he, he gave them the experience. There's there's parts where he goes and says, okay, you guys go on out, and then we're going to meet back up later. You know, he's giving them the experience, giving them the, the teaching. Um, there's there's even one part where, where Jesus is talking to one of his disciples, his name was Peter, and he says, you know, you're going to you're gonna mess up really bad, okay? This is not going to be great for you, but check it out, okay? I, I've prayed for you, and when when after you've messed up, you're, you're going to come back around, and when you come back around, strengthen the others, other disciples. You still have a job afterwards. You're going to mess up, but, you know, it's not it's not going to be the end of the end of your ministry. It's not going to be the end of your world, okay? So, you know, preparing them the whole time um, for, 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 you know, what's coming, but then that, that didn't, he didn't stop there after he dies and he's resurrected. He doesn't go just go to heaven and say, okay, see y'all later, losers. No, he comes back and says, okay, now let's kind of go over a couple of things that we talked about. And there's this one time that he's walking with two of them to a place called Damascus. And he spends the whole walk just explaining to them things from the Old Testament so that they can understand it deeper. They can have a better understanding of what's going on. The very first thing that the church needed was Jesus' instruction or the word, the Bible. Um, and, uh, Jesus has spent years teaching and guiding them. And, you know, the thing that surprises me, and I find it in myself, I'm not saying this so I can say, I've seen somebody here do this. No, I'm saying in myself. We always want a fresh word from God, right? Everybody wants a fresh word from God. No, Nobody wants to go to a church and just feel like everything's dead. But we always want this new, fresh word from God. But then the thing is, when it's given, it is almost immediately forgotten. God gives us a special word. It means something to us, and then we we forget about it. And then like a year later, you say, hey, what was that word? I remember it being important at the time, and it really helped me at the time. What was it? You know, and, and we forget it. It has, it's sometimes it's not even that long, maybe two months, maybe one month. You know, or uh, and, and the same thing is true of the Bible. I mean, the Bible is definitely our instruction for life. It's, it's something that God gave us to help us. But how do we usually go to the Bible, though? Uh, I don't really have time to read it. I can skip a day. It's not going to really impact me that much, you know. I mean, I mean, come on. Don't look at me like that. Surely you guys do this too sometimes, right? Don't look at me like I'm the crazy one. When we all know it's my dad. He's the crazy one. And uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so we want these fresh words, but then we, we instantly forget it. And then we do the same thing with the Bible where every time you go to the Bible, you're going to find something new that you didn't see there before. You know, when I, when we, when, when we all thought it was cancer, um, in here, 
uh, I stumbled upon this, this, this psalm that was just exactly what I was feeling. And I was able to read it in such a way that it's like I was, it's like I was, it's like the words were my own. I totally like related with the words. I connected with what was being said. Um, you know, and then uh, after we found out that it wasn't cancer, but there was something else, um, there was a different part of the scripture that I was reading and it just hopped out at me. And it's just something that brought me comfort. And that's something that the Bible does. You don't have to have somebody give you a word for it to be a fresh word. The Bible has a way of being 2,000 years old and yet still being brand new. And I don't know exactly how that works, but I know in my own life I've seen it happen time and time again. So the very first of the four things that we need and the church need, they needed it back then. We need it now. The church as a whole still needs it is Jesus' instruction. Um, so God wants us to stand in faith on the word that he has already given us. See, what we want is we want constant validation. Every day we want we want to wake up and have God, you know, just make it better. Like, you know, you get up and take a Tylenol or something, you know, something that will just kind of ease that. But what God wants to do is he wants us to take us through this process of growth and maturity and in many ways discomfort to produce in us something that doesn't isn't produced naturally. It's not natural for us to stay the course, to grow in our faith, to, to trust God more each day. It's natural for us to find things in the world to satisfy us, to not seek after God, to do our own thing, to, you know, to just live however we want. That's natural. Right, right. But I'm talking about what comes naturally. You don't really have to give any effort to being selfish. You learn it when you're, you're when you're an infant, and the more you grow older, it doesn't really change. You just always, there's something inside of you that's just always bent to be self-caring. It just comes natural. But God takes us through these processes that are oftentimes uncomfortable. And the thing is, is we put this shield of protection around us. You know, if you're like a and d player, cloak of protection. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, and uh, of this idea that, that we are immortal. We don't ever have to worry about problems. We don't, we're never going to have health problems or nothing's going to change. It's going to be fine. And we do everything to kind of wrap ourselves in this cocoon of, of, of lies so that we feel more comfortable. You know, I don't have to worry about my inevitable death. I don't have to worry about how am I going to pay for my medication when I get older? How am I going to, all these things that are just uncomfortable to think about. We just have a way of blocking it off. Well, God has a way of, instead of that, he says, look, you're not going to make it out of this thing alive anyways. <laughs> None of us are going to make it to the end of the level without dying, okay? I hate to be the fair of bad news here. Um, but what he does is he says, so instead of focusing on that, which is just going to give you more anxiety and fear, how about I take you over here and we can grow your character and you can live a way more fulfilling life than you would have. And it's like, oh, well, I don't really want to do that. And God's like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm taking you on this trip because you don't want you don't want to do this. Um, it's it's like it's like when, when you take your kid to an amusement park, right? And uh, there's that slide that they really want to go on, but they're really scared to go on. And so you're like, okay, let's go. I'll go with you. And they're like, oh, okay. And you get in the seat, you button, and then, and then the thing comes down. And then they kind of start freaking out a little bit because they're like, oh, I can't get out now. And then you go up the thing. You know the thing I'm talking about. And this is the part where the kid freaks out. He's like, oh, man, I want to get off. Okay, let's just stop the ride. I see a walkway there. I'll just go down the walkway. And uh, meanwhile, the guy running the running the thing is like, nope, it's too late. The, the bar's down. You just got to deal with it, okay? And the kid's like, you know, and then you go down the wall. And the, the, the camera goes off right at that moment. You know the moment where the kid has this look on the face? You know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> so then you reach the bottom, like, that's so fun. Let's do it again. And you're like, are you sure? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that <laughs> that's not what you were saying five seconds ago. And, and that's kind of how it works, too. You know, God takes us on these paths that are more wholesome, but really freaking scary. God, God doesn't really take us on these ways that, that we would choose. They're, they're hard. They're uncomfortable. They're scary. And, uh, yeah, and then, then the other thing that, that uh, really is one of my pet peeves is he doesn't actually ask us if we're okay with it. Like, hey, I'm going to throw this curveball. Is that cool? <laughs> no, he's just kind of like, oh, you're <laughs> It's like when you have that dad who always wants you to be athletic, but you're not athletic. So he just throws the ball at you and expects you to catch it. And you're just like, oh, my eye. <laughs> uh, anyways, 
Um, so God wants us to stand in faith on the word he has already given us, not to constantly need new validation. Trials come, but they teach us to believe in what God said. See, we have this head knowledge, but, but there's a difference between believing and knowing something. You know, and there's a lot of things that we know in our heads, but we don't really believe. It's not something we really put in in in, in, in practice. Um, and you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. Okay, so you read in Romans eight twenty eight and it says, God works all things for the good. And you know, okay, well that's good, and it's good that you read it. But that's just head knowledge. Okay, yeah, I agree with that. Well, what happens when something happens, like I mentioned before, like a, a, your child dies? It's a little bit harder to take that real world situation and say okay god works all things for good you see these two disconnected thoughts and all of a sudden the rubber meets the road and you have head knowledge that now becomes belief or disbelief it's something where god takes us on this magical journey <laughs> of, of, of suffering and torment for our good <laughs> and it's not i'm not it's not always bad that's not what i'm saying i'm just trying to make it lighthearted. Um, so, anyways, that's that's the first thing that uh, the four things that we need. The second thing that they uh, that they needed was the Holy Spirit. the The second thing the church needed to move forward was the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing we need now. And back in that passage that I read, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. So let me get this straight, Jesus. You want to start the church, and this big religion that's going to go all over the world. You, you want us to start this, and you want us to do it by not leaving the couch. Huh. I, I don't think that idea is going to catch on until COVID. But uh, I think that uh, maybe Jesus was just ahead of his time, maybe. Because this, this isn't the way that you start a church, Jesus. I don't know, you know where you're getting your information from, but I have a better way to do it. Well, Jesus had already had his better way to do it. And instead of saying, hey, just start running out there crazy and just go off without a plan. He says, don't even leave Jerusalem. Okay. But wait for what the Father promised, which he said, you heard from me. I've told you about this. For John, the ba uh, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Well, it's a little bit different than how we kind of go through things. Sometimes, especially <laughs> growing up in the church, I can say this, kind of just like, go and do something before you even know what you're doing. And then you get halfway through and you're like, we shouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> uh, and this is something that we still need in our lives today. And it's something that the church still needs. We still need the Holy Spirit. The thing that blows me away is that the church, I'll go back here, is that the church didn't need slogans. They didn't need the perfect sales mo or business model. They, they didn't need all the answers. That's where I would have thought would have happened because that's a big question nowadays people are, well what happens if somebody asks me a question i don't know the answer to you so you would think that jesus would be like okay so i i wrote a couple books here they give all the answers to the hard questions so just kind of study those through that's not what he said at all not at all and uh, kind of a complete difference from a lot of the things that, that i always felt were essential growing up i always thought you know just do something even if you know what you're doing that's the first thing and then uh, have all the answers so that if somebody you know, questions you on anything, you can really make them feel real stupid about how they didn't know that, you know. You know, that, that's just kind of growing up, how, how I kind of did think. Well, you guys have been kids before, right? You ever had a, had a loud mouth? Come on, you guys didn't grow up as, as, as adults. Um, okay, uh, so they didn't need slogans or all the answers. They didn't have flashy suits or cars. It's, here they are, just a bunch of, I mean, th these people aren't the most educated people. There's a couple fisher, fishermen in there, and, you know, it, the, the most scholars nowadays believe Peter didn't even know how to write, and uh, he picked it up gradually later on. And that when he re wrote Second Peter, that's why Second Peter is such r so rough in the original Greek is because he probably wrote it himself, and it's just it's just a train wreck. Whereas First Peter, he had somebody else write it for him. It's very very well written Greek. And if you ever learn Greek, you'll go back and you'll see what I'm talking about. But, anyways. Um, and, you know, so, so they didn't have, they, these, these weren't like the, the, the top-notch people. They didn't have the perfect smile. You know those California people? You know the, you know, the smiles? No, <laughs> I'm Californian too, Elizabeth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the salesmen, you know, like the, the, the big megachurch pastors. You know, they, they, they have, just have that toothy smile, and you're like, I like you. I don't know why yet, but I like you. Um, 
So they were actually instructed not to go and make and, and recruit people until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus put such a heavy emphasis on this that he actually delayed the starting of the church until it could go forward with the Holy Spirit. Somewhere along the line, though, we've lost these two things. I, I, can, I can be a Christian, a strong Christian. I don't even have to read my Bible regularly. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about my struggles, okay? So if you do this too, hey, great, you, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm not pointing fingers at y'all. I'm talking about me. Or, and then the second thing, oh, I can do this. I can go through the motions. I can, I can do my ministry. I can touch people. I don't really need the Holy Spirit. I can just kind of go through. Well, if we didn't need the Holy Spirit, why did Jesus delay the church's beginning <laughs> inception without, you know, the Holy Spirit? So they were actually told not to go. And this is upside down logic to us. Like a lot of Jesus' teachings are, sound very upside down to us. Hey, if you want to be first, you have to be last. But God, if I want to get ahead, don't I have to cut people off? You know, there's just Jesus' teachings went against how we naturally think about things. And, uh, you know, it's good to prepare. It's good to serve people. But the idea that we need neither Jesus' word nor his spirit and we can conquer in life and lead others to God. It's just faulty. It's a faulty way of thinking. We are completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. We are completely dependent on the Word. We don't have the brains to lead this thing on our own. We just don't. If you don't believe me, stop reading the Bible. Stop praying. Stop going to church. Just kind of do your own thing for about six months. And uh, tell me if you feel better or worse. I mean, they did a study. And I was going to mention this later, but I'll mention it now. Um, they did a study, and if and if you read the Bible four times or more per week, you are 53% less likely to look at pornography. 53% less likely to look at pornography. That's one aspect of the study. There were other things that they did, too. It wasn't just all about pornography. But, I mean, that was one of the things of it. Reading the Bible four times a week, 53% more likely. I mean, less likely. I mean, that blows me away. Uh, you would think that all these different miracle cures that people have of, oh, get off of porn, stop looking at porn, da da da, da. You'd think that number one would be, hey, read the Bible, 53%. That's, that's okay. I can deal with that. Um, so it, it's good to prepare. It's good to serve people. But we got to get past this idea that we don't need the Bible. We don't need the Holy Spirit. That just, it's just wrong. So one thing I want to point out before we go to the third thing is the church has always been tempted, just like today, to kind of sidestep. The first thing I want to mention about sidestepping is they were very much so tempted, just like now, to get to get uh, distracted with when is the end, right? So now there's this whole war with Ukraine and Russia. What are people? What are we asking as a church? Is this the end? Is Jesus coming back? All this nonsense. It's like who cares? <laughs> D didn't you just read this? And th let me read it again because I, I bet you guys weren't like me. You did not hear it the first time. I had to read it a couple times before I saw this. In verse six, it said, "When they came together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to do this?'" Is this the time of your return? Is this when you're setting stuff up? And that's what we're still doing. Instead of going and, 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 and getting our roots in the Bible and the Holy Spirit, we're still saying, when you're coming back, Jesus. And the whole time Jesus is saying, didn't I say this 2,000 years ago? Get in the Word, get in the Holy Spirit, and leave the end alone. And in fact, that's what Jesus says. It's not for you to know periods, uh, um, periods of time or appointed times, which the Father is set by his own authority. It's not for you. Mind your own business, okay? <laughs> Mind your business. I got stuff covered. You just do what I told you to do. And it's the same thing we need today. We still, just like back then, just because we aren't starting the church doesn't mean that we don't need the same thing to move forward. Not just as a church, but as individuals. I want I want to be happy in life. I want to be more accomplished. I want to get done my list. I want to do leave something of value. I want to, you know, all these things we want to do. Well, the first thing we should have on that list somewhere. <laughs> Number one, we need Jesus' instruction. Number two, we need the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think that we see that right here. I mean, was, did Peter leave anything of value as far as literature? Not really. You don't see his bestseller on, you know, the front wall at Barnes & Noble. Did he, did he start this, you know, uh, did he just say the most clever things? No, actually, I know a lot of authors who said many more clever things than he did. But what did he do? He did exactly what Jesus had appointed him to do. And he did it well. And he finished well. So, I mean, that seems like it's worth it. So, okay, so the church, just like today, they were tempted to get distracted by, is this the end? But another thing we see is they were tempted to get distracted with squabbles, petty fighting, things that just like let it go. 
And for that, I'll have to move forward just a few chapters. It's a couple chapters, but it's not that long afterwards. It's in chapter 6, verse 1, and I'm just going to read the one verse. I'm not going to get real ahead of myself here. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Now, at this time, as the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint developed on the part of the Hellenistic Jews um, against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And I'll, let me read just a little bit further so you kind of see what's going on here. So the, so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. This is, this is a fight that is distracting us from the purpose that we're actually here to do. So instead, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Interesting that the two things that they just said there was full of the spirit, so that would be the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. That takes us back to Jesus' instruction. Those are the two things that they were looking for in these, in these seven men. And their job was pretty much just to solve the problem. <laughs> Fix it. That's what we say to Ben all the time whenever anything goes wrong. Fix it, Ben. And that's exactly what these what these guys said to the seven. Fix it. Uh, you know, something's going on here with the widows. Just fix it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so just like today, they were distracted. They they were very tempted to get distracted by petty squabbles. And, you know, if you go to church any amount of time or really anything, if you do anything in your life for any amount of time, you're going to be tempted to get involved in a fight or a squabble. Or, just let it go. Just just let it go. I mean, this isn't new to the church. It's not something new to humanity. Um, it, the Bible doesn't mention it, but I strongly suspect that Adam and Eve uh, did have marital conflict. <laughs> I strongly suspect that they lived 900 and something years. Yeah, not fighting with your wife for 900 years. Okay, buddy. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the third thing that we need and they needed is vision. Now, you might say vision like sight. No, not like sight. I'm not talking about eating your carrots. <laughs> I'm talking about what are we here for? Vision is what are we here for? The third thing that the church needed to move forward back then was vision. What were they there for? They needed to have a clear idea of where they were going. And that's exactly what Jesus says to them. They, they say, hey, uh, Jesus, is this the end? Is this the time of the end? Do we need to start like worrying or having an underground basement or anything like that, like what's going on? And he says, okay, no, no, no. That's not for you. The father set that down by his own authority. And then this is the very next thing that he says. The very next thing that he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the earth. There's your mission. There's your, have some vision for what your mission is. Where are you going? That's where you're going. You're going to be my, you're going to be my witness to the, to the farthest ends of the earth. Okay? But Jesus, is this the end times? You're going to be my witness to the very end. Of, I don't understand what you're doing. Come on! And nothing has really changed here. So the third thing that they needed is still the same thing that we still need today, vision. There has to be a mission, a purpose. It wasn't keeping the church clean. They, didn't, they weren't focused on coming every week and making sure that there was no dirt on the floor. Um, they didn't make sure that the pews were all dusted off. The, they didn't have things their own way. They didn't sing the right songs. They didn't stay busy with important things that just weren't really necessary. It was focusing on the main mission, making Jesus known. You're going to be my witnesses to the farthest part of the earth. That was the mission. And uh, if you grew up in church like I do, like I did, you know that many times churches kind of get in these ruts of, just finding things to fight about and finding things to occupy time that don't really do anything. You do the same thing every single week. And I did this for years at the last church. And then for part of the time that I, a couple years when I was here doing the same thing every single week so that you can say that you did it again for another week. And then you get there the next week so you can get it done another week. You pick out the song so that you can sing the song so that you can sing the songs in the service. So then the songs end. You pick out songs for the next week. So you can see what I mean? It just gets to be this endless ro ro rotation of re re repetition. And a lot of people like repetition. They like doing the same thing every week. It gives them a lot of comfort. I hate it. I feel like I'm a hamster in a wheel. Do you notice how if you ever go to my house and you see my bookshelf, you'll notice that I didn't buy one book 500 times. I have a bunch of different books. That's because I don't want to sit there reading the same thing over and over again. I want to, when I finish the story, I'll read it again. Just I'm going to go read something else and then I'll go back to it later. I mean, Lord of the Rings is great, but I don't want to read it every month for the rest of my life. I mean, I want I want something else. Um, 
so there was there was a mission and it was more than just doing this thing it was more than a to-do list and the things that they did as an as an early church if you read through the first couple of chapters of x of acts the, the the things that they did revolved around making jesus known look look what we see in, in acts chapter 2 i'm not going to read it but uh the holy spirit comes they're filled with the holy spirit excuse me and uh then they're all like these, these guys are drunk they're just crazy they're drunk whatever um and you know, then Peter gives this whole long message, and then that's pretty much the rest of Acts 2 is him preaching to the people, and then a bunch of people get saved. Okay? I would say that that conforms pretty well to making Jesus known, not going to a building every week that they get to clean and say, hey, I hung the new signs up, or hey, I picked out the songs for next week. Well, good for you. <laughs> um, and not that things, you know, things don't need to get done, but there's main mission, and then there's kind of everything else. You know, and as a church, sometimes we get so focused on everything else. And uh, that's kind of what the church a lot of times in the past 50 years has gotten known for is not the main thing, but everything else. So, you know, Sunday we have a Bible study and then we have a service. And then on Wednesday, we're going to have another Bible study. OK. You're just doing the same thing every, every week. Our nice little comfortable routine, you know, and uh, we don't do that here anymore, thank God. But <laughs> it will first off, it kind of just kills your enthusiasm for ministry. But uh, you know, singing off it doesn't really help anybody. A dead church it just goes through the motions. It doesn't really impact anybody's life. And uh, how can you possibly impact somebody else's life when your your life isn't impacted? I mean, it just it, it makes sense. So here, you know, pre in, in chapter two they're preaching. Then when in chapter three. We get, they're walking to the synagogue. They're just minding their own business, and there's this beggar there, and he wants money. And Peter's like, you know, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I do have, and he heals the guy. And uh, then, after healing the guy, everybody's like, what? As though Jesus wasn't there just like a month and a half doing this ago doing the same thing. That, that always blows my mind. Like, do you not remember this guy, Jesus, that I'm talking about? Like, he, he was healing all y'alls. What's going on? Anyways. So, you know, he heals, and so then everybody's like, well, what's going on? So Peter gives another sermon, and he's telling things. And so then the, 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 the leaders of the synagogue get kind of upset and say, you know, try and talk them out of it and all that, and they get arrested and all that. But uh, kind of beside the point, my, my moral story being here, so in, in chapter 2, preaching. In chapter 3, they're serving people. Uh, in chapter, or I'm sorry, in chapter 3, they're serving people. Then we get to chapter 4, and they're arrested and punished unfairly. In fact, they even say here, um, well, I'll, I'll read that part later, so I won't read it now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I won't read it now. But anyways, and uh, so then in chapter 4, they're being suffered for doing the, and they're suffering for doing the right thing. And then we get to the end of chapter 4, and we see that they're, that all the, all the Christians are, are helping one another. They're all just kind of like a family. They're all just kind of working together. So what do we see? We see preaching in two, serving in three, suffering in four, loving it at the end of chapter four. We see what is at the heart of making Jesus known. That's what the church is about. So do you ever feel like people are persecuting you unfairly? Hey, don't worry too much. That's part of the process. <laughs> so, and then we get to 541, and I believe this is the part that I was about to read a second ago. And it says, so they went on their way. Yes, this, this is exactly it. So they went on their way from the pr presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, our sufferings are precious. They are. They're precious to God. And, uh, you know, they do matter. Remember that when you're going through these times of suffering, though, not, not, to, not to groan and complain. Instead, remember that God disciplines those who he loves. Now, I thought that what that meant was God punishes those that he loves. And that's not discipline. Punishment can be a part of discipline, but discipline is more like instruction. Discipline is more like taking the time to teach your son that he's throwing the ball wrong. Instead of making fun of him, no, no, son, you want to hold the ball like this and you throw it like this. It's taking the time. It's instruction. It's that discipline. And that's what God does. God disciplines those who he loves. He teaches us things. He, he doesn't just leave us off on our own to, to, you know, dwindle down into oblivion. He takes the time to teach us things. And, uh, okay, so then the fourth and final thing of the four things that we need, that they also needed, prayer. 
And I just now realized that the spacing on prayer is off, guys. Oh, that's terrible. Look at that. They're all spaced from the numbers except for prayer. Golly. That's going to be the only, it's the only thing I can see now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be up at night. Oh, my God, it wasn't perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you're telling me shoddy workman right here. You know, it's a it's a shoddy carpenter that blames his, his hammer. <laughs> okay. 541, Acts 541. Chapter 5, verse 41. Okay, so that takes us to four. Okay. The things are the, the fourth thing that the church needed to move forward was prayer. If you go back into chapter 1, so let, let's follow the progression here, okay? Jesus raises from the dead. He appears to his disciples again, gives them a few last words, and then he ascends into heaven. And this is, this is, this is what we get to in, in verse 12. Um, then they returned to Jerusalem, this is the disciples, from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upstairs room where they were staying. That is Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there they are, and they're just praying, which is interesting to notice that, he, that it mentions there that Jesus' brothers were there because Jesus' brothers didn't follow him when he was on earth. Um, they didn't actually believe in him until after he, after he was resurrected, he came and made a special appearance to them, and then they believed. So this is just shortly after they start believing that Jesus really is the Christ. And it's just kind of interesting. It doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm saying tonight, but I just thought it was interesting. Uh, and so then they, they go, and, and what, what, what's the order of the day? What's the business? What did they not want to be distracted from when, when, the, when the problems were coming up? We don't want to get distracted from our main purpose of, of prayer and the word. that we, this, is, this is what we were here for. Problems are going to come and go. We don't have to handle all of them ourselves. We're going to delegate this so that we can do what God called us to do. And uh, so, so, okay, those, those are the four things that the church needed then before they could move forward. Before we have the rest of the book of Acts, the rest of the last 2,000 years of Christian history, the, 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 before any of that. The four things they needed to move forward after Jesus left them. The instruction, the Holy Spirit, clear vision, and prayer. It's the same things that, that we ourselves need in our own life, and it's the exact same thing that every church still needs. And it, those are the only things that will sustain. Let's see, let's see. And it's the only thing that will sustain the church moving forward. So these four things are what made the church and enabled it to move forward. These are still the same four things we need to move forward. I mentioned that. Um, Jesus' instruction, the word, the Holy Spirit, vision, prayer. Okay, said that. Um, okay, there's one other thing I want to say. We, we don't graduate from the basics. There's never going to be a time when you know so much, you're so smart, that you don't need the Bible. You don't need the Holy Spirit. You don't need prayer. You, you, you don't need vision. You can just wander through life. Let me, let me tell you, if you don't have a clear vision in your life, everything you do is going to just, it's going to feel like you're, it's never good enough. You're going to accomplish something big, and you're going to say, Okay, uh, here I'll give you a good, good example. Last year, uh, I biked uh, 2,500 miles on my bike. Uh, and, you know, that was a really big goal for me. It was very hard to do. Um, but am I still as excited today as I was about it last year? No, no, I'm not. I even have a big freaking trophy. And I, I, I still just, I mean, that was a goal for then, and it's something that I achieved, but it didn't sustain me for the rest of my life. See what I mean? So anyways, um, it, and I already mentioned that, so I don't need to read that. Um, so read your Bible and pray. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you might say, well, how is that going to happen? Start with prayer. Start with prayer. Read the Bible. And we'll, the baby steps will get there. Gain fresh vision to where the church is going and how you fit into that plan. This church, our mission here at the church, is to build bridges in the community and bring people to God. That's what this church exists for. That's, that's our mission. It's our driving force. Every time that we have the opportunity to do something, we ask, does it conform, conform to this? And if it doesn't, we don't do it. It's that simple. And uh, so find out, you know, g gain a fresh vision for the church. Gain a fresh vision for yourself. And uh, okay. So that's it. So I'm going to go to the black screen because I think that's a, I don't have a closing slide and it's better than anything, I guess. Uh, Norval, can you close this in prayer, please?